All right. So welcome back to Trials and Tribulations, Level S Podcast. Um, today, Larry and I are going to talk about, in a broad sense, lawyer civility. Um, but I guess in a smaller sense, the breakdown of civility over lawyers behaving badly, right? And, Maybe you know, that's going to be the title for this. It could be. That's a good title. Yeah. Lawyers behaving badly, or some behave well. It just depends on who you're talking about. But I think, you know, in we still have like sort of one foot in the door and one foot out in the practice. And me in particular, I do a lot of the work with this company with Idea and Level for a collection, and I, so I deal with lawyers. And I don't know. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's them. Maybe it's a combination of both. But it just seems that the idea now is how can you fight and argue over every little point and make your point as opposed to doing things to actually get your case to the conclusion and acting civilly towards one another. I mean, I can't think of one other profession where two people who are similarly situated, both have the same degree, both are in the same profession, do everything that they possibly can to harm and hurt the person that they're working against rather than just working towards a reasonable yeah, conclusion. It, it's a problem that's become, I think, more acute during our careers. I think that's something that there's a lot of focus on it now because it's gotten out of control. And when I've thought about the issue, there's several things. One is the inescapable, inescapable reality that it's an adversarial system, right? And a lot of times it's zero sum. So it is a competition. Number two, I also think that a lot of times there's a risk and reward calculus that's going on. In other words, a lot of times there's no consequences for bad behavior. And I think that is the real problem. And that dovetails with anonymity and overrun court systems where you have one judge for every thousand lawyers and things like that. So there's a lot of things for us to unpack today. Well, yeah, I, I agree. I think that the zero sum is true and, and competition is true. I think, but if I'm analogizing it to sports, you know, when, when I was a kid, when teams they guys didn't know each other because you know of the, there was no internet there was no social media so a player that played let's say in california playing against a player who played in new york they didn't know each other so they didn't really care about each other personally yeah they didn't like each other fights could break out there was a lot of adversarial stuff going on in athletics now they all seem to know one another and you'll see routinely when you watch sports players on opposite teams are shaking hands giving hugs sl slapping five um, it's the opposite i think with lawyers in that the more prevalent either social media or competition through the internet has become, the more personally adversarial lawyers seem to become. I, I'm okay, and I love the idea of the adversarial system when you're in the courtroom, when you're arguing your points, when you're putting things down on paper, but it's like the personal attacks and animus that exists yeah. just on a regular phone call. Right. It's, it's just mind numbing. That's when it gets out of control. Lawyers tend to lose sense of the idea that the case will end eventually. And you'll see that opposing counsel again and again and again. You'll see them whether it be in court, you'll see them when you're picking your kids up from school. So it's, the, it's a sense of community that when that's lost, the self-policing is lost, and there's no consequences for this bad behavior. People don't have a reputation one way or the other. The judges don't know all the lawyers one way or the other. And the self-policing aspect of the practice of law, which is one of the cornerstones of being a lawyer is that, all right, the bar self polices, but when you when it when you lose the effectiveness of that system, things start to spin out of control, and I think that's been going on for many years now. And I and there's no doubt that it's worse in some places than in others. And there's also very little doubt that it may be the worst here in Miami Dade County. Well, one of the things that I, I think you and I have both seen is just in our particular community is is the growth of the community. So explosive growth, right? So as as Miami in particular has gotten larger, people have become, like you said, more anonymous. Back when we first started practicing, although there were a lot of lawyers, the community was smaller, so people knew one another. And so the idea that you would come across that person again or have to work with them again, or they may tell another person about the way that you behaved, so that might regulate your behavior, yes. that all mattered. But today, I see pleadings now where I have no idea who the lawyers are. I've never even heard of the law firms. They may have come from another city, another place. They're recruiting lawyers from out throughout the city of Miami. And so this may be happening in other larger cities where because people don't know one another and don't care to get to know one another, that breakdown occurs. And then it just becomes an every man for themselves type yeah. of attitude where people just want to attack each other. There's no civility. And again, there's no consequences for bad behavior. Let's 
to, to make the point clear, let's draw a comparison between Miami-Dade County and some small county in Florida where you and I have practiced. You know, when we were practicing more heavily, we traveled around the state to a lot of different jurisdictions, all of them smaller than Miami, a lot of them, if not most of them, much smaller. So let's compare that. Let's, let's use just a theoretical county, right? Well, maybe we're in Miami right now, how many circuit judges are there? Maybe 40, 50? Uh, yeah, a lot. I don't even know anymore. Let's say 50. I know in a smaller county in Florida, maybe there's three. Right. Two. And what is that? What's, what are, what's the consequence of having so, you know, so few judges who know all of the lawyers? What happens there? There's self-policing. Right. A lawyer knows, all right, I better not lie. Because, I mean, how many times have you heard lawyers just, just bold-faced lying in court? Which I remember as a young lawyer, I was like, I cannot believe this guy's lying to the judge. But there's no consequences a lot of times, if not all of the times. Well, that's, so that's ethics, right? So there's two different areas that we can focus on. There's ethics, which obviously lying in court is unethical and it can get you in serious trouble. But then there's just pure civility where yeah. I know that there are bar rules that say that you should or need to act in a civil manner, but that's ambiguous. And, and aspirational. Yeah. And what is and is not civil and considered civil, I guess, is all in the eye of the beholder. So then you get into litigation and I've had calls even recently with lawyers where the very first call that I have, the person on the other end of the call just wants to get into a brawl. They don't know me. They have no idea what, what my approach is going to be to the matter that we're discussing, but their initial out-of-the-box way of handling the situation is to act like an attack dog, to be disrespectful, and to try to pick some petty argument over nothing rather than saying, okay, we may not disagree on the facts of the case. We may want to argue against one another during this case, but what can we do to try to work together at least while we have to because we're stuck with each other? That's not the way that this works. Instead, it's an immediate bad attitude. It's an immediate, I want to fight over nothing, and I want to prove that I'm going to be the tough guy or the tough guy. All right, girl. well, it's basic psychology. So I'll ask you again, you know, bring it back to one of my first points. Is that type of behavior rewarded? Well, I guess yes. And, and the reason, and that's a bad thing. And I, I don't want to get into the plaintiff versus defendant in a general sense, but it's hard not to. When well, you, that's your background. Well, it, so when you look at it, I think I've heard, and from people who hire lawyers on the defense side in particular, that they want somebody who treats the plaintiff lawyer badly. They want somebody who is going to be extremely rude and aggressive and adversarial, because to them, the layperson, that signifies strength. And, but it, it, what they fail to realize is acting that way does nothing more than slow down the progress of the case, slow down getting to the end, because then you have all these side issues, lawyers wanting to file personal motions for sanctions, wanting to get into things that have nothing to do with the merits of the case, and just yeah. extend unnecessarily the case entirely. Well, you bring up something really interesting that just occurred to me now, and it's almost as though there's an identification, whether it be the lawyer identifies with the client and, and that, that line disappears, or the client on the other side identifies the lawyer with, with uh, the opposing client. And I think that's a dangerous dynamic. Of course, when you're representing a client, you gotta be all in. But there has to be that line, there has to be some separation between you as a professional representing the client as opposed to you becoming the client. And I think that there's a tendency for lawyers to become their client. And, and not and, and, and forget about that separation. And when that happens, then things start to become personal. And then that just exacerbates any sort of breakdown. And you're right. And I, I do think it's, it's very important, and I, and I say this as a plaintiff's lawyer, for a lawyer to really have an understanding of what their client is going through. So having some personal attachment to a case is not necessarily a bad thing, because if you're gonna zealously, zealously advocate for your client, you have to, in a way, try your best to feel what they are feeling. No that, doubt. That's a great way to practice law. So if you're representing a family of somebody who's lost a loved one, you know, you want to go into their house, you want to see what the, the, the family was like, you want to understand them so that you can best represent them by trying to put yourself as best you can in their shoes. However, that does not mean that you are them and you suddenly need to have a negative attitude or approach toward the person that is tasked with representing the other side. You know, in most situations, especially on the defense side, 
the defense lawyers are selected not by the client themselves, but by the client's insurance mm-hmm. company. So you have the client, whether it's a hospital or a doctor, construction company, driver, it could be anybody. They don't go out and pick their own lawyer. Their lawyer, they go to their insurance company and their insurance company says, okay, insurance client, this is gonna be your lawyer. And they meet for the very first time. So and maybe it, the last. <laughs> it, it, perhaps. Yeah. Which is even more of a reason why yes. that lawyer on the defense side has no reason to take anything personally. They should be focusing on getting the job done as best they can for their client, but not taking a position where somehow the plaintiff lawyer is a bad person and needs to be treated like a bad person. That just All that does is muck things up and make it difficult to get cases to a conclusion. Yeah, I agree with you. And what's interesting is that For a while, as you know, and you did some of it with me, I was doing some family law. And that was a a few years of my career, I did some family law cases, I was trained to do them. And and so I'd pick some up here and there. So I had some exposure to the family law bar here in Miami-Dade County. And, and, you know, the the family law lawyers, pretty small group, most of them know one another. And, and I think it's a pretty tight bar. I guess it's analogous to the bankruptcy bar. Yeah, bankruptcy are very, very you know, tight. tight. These are tight groups, and there's only so many of them. And, you know, they're and always... they see each other all the time. They see each other all the time, and, they're, you know, they're up against, you know, the odds are they're going to be up against one of 15, 10 guys, right? So I saw when I was in that environment, I saw that, you know, obviously divorce cases, child custody cases, child support cases, they're crazy. Crazy, crazy things happen. People are going through a lot of stress and trauma. They do pretty crazy things. So the stuff that happens outside the courtroom that then gets brought into the courtroom, it's pretty explosive stuff. And I see, I saw a lot of these practitioners, they were aggressive in court and they were obviously advocating for their clients, but outside of the courtroom, these were they were buddies. This was part of a community. So the, my point is the two things, even out of the most extreme circumstances, you know, which is family law. The two, you know, the two things are not mutually exclusive. You can still be cordial, even friends with your opponent and still go at it in court. And that's, you, you, your point is really... And it, and it comes down to that separation. And I think that the, the things that happen t- to a, 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 family law, a family law practitioner, I, well, this is like the, the craziest euphemism, divorce lawyers. You can't call them <laughs> divorce lawyers anymore. The things that happen <laughs> to divorce lawyers' clients are outrageous. You know, domestic violence, calling the cops. It's just fight after fight after fight. You know, people are at their worst, and that's really. Like, it's scorched earth And it's stuff. that, scorched yeah. earth stuff, but it's really the ex, soon-to-be ex-spouses scorching the earth, right? right? Whether or not their lawyers tell them to do it, they don't care. So these are the most extreme circumstances these lawyers are dealing with. And I see that those guys have really learned how to separate themselves from that, right? When the time's appropriate, they'll become that in court and advocate very aggressively and skillfully. But the second they're outside of that that disappears. And I think that that's a very valuable skill that they learn that perhaps a lot of lawyers outside of that area of practice never learn. So I I may have a a conclusion as to why or a reason as to why, I don't know, but just hear me out. In the world of divorce law, everybody's getting paid by the hour. So when it comes to being a lawyer, if you drag things out or the client drags things out, They're just going to have to pay more for the service. So it's the lawyer obviously wants to try to get to the end, but they're not going to sit there and argue about whether they need to be back in court because that's just you know more billable hours for that lawyer. Obviously, their goal is to get the case to a conclusion, but these guys are aligned at least in their interests with respect to economics. Whereas on, a pl- on the plaintiff side for personal injury, the plaintiff lawyer is getting paid on a contingency. So he has he or she has every reason to try to move the case along as quickly that dynamic as different. possible. Yes. So you get you get your case done in a month, and you get the same result as you got the case done in a year, you're going to make that money in a month instead of making that money in a year. Whereas the defense lawyer on that same case has to make their money by billing the case. So they have to, they're have they under a lot of pressure internally to bill and to extend that case out as long as possible because that creates more hours and creates more revenue for that firm. So there is zero alignment of interest between those two sides. Now, when I was practicing more as a plaintiff lawyer, I understood 
that the defense lawyers needed to make money. That was part of their job. I would still advocate to try to get the case done as quickly as possible, but if they needed to file their motions or get their things into court, that was just part of the process. And you can't take it personally. Right, you cannot. Yeah. But I think there's a there's two areas of, of, of personal attack there. It's the one, the plaintiff lawyer who resents the defense lawyer for trying to delay the case to maybe bill more. And then there may be the defense lawyer who may have some resentment on the plaintiff side because these guys are able to pull out a contingency fee on a percentage as opposed to, you know, grinding it on an hourly basis. So those that misalignment of interest may be what's leading to more personal animosity. And then, of course, there's the competition. It, the fact that you have to compete for the business so much on both sides now it drives you to, to be a different person when you finally get it because you need to prove your worth. Well, you're right. That that does put a lot more pressure on everybody. When you just look at the numbers, let's just use Florida as an example. You know, the amount of licensed attorneys in Florida over the last 50 years, we'll call it. I mean, it's just it, it's remarkable and there's it's not like the as many you know, there's not as many cases to go around anymore. It's just simple math. And there's the sucking up of a lot of the cases by advertising sure. lawyers and then there's the anger about the insurance companies so you know you also have plaintiff lawyers who are just as guilty because they tend to hold the defense lawyers accountable for the actions of insurance companies and insurance lobbyists so insurance companies and insurance lobbyists are constantly trying to destroy plaintiff lawyers they they are the the natural enemy of a plaintiff yeah, lawyer that's true however the lawyers that are hired to defend those insurance companies they're not the natural enemy of the plaintiff lawyer they're just lawyers that are being hired to do a job for a client but the plaintiff lawyers then tend to mold them all together and consider the defense lawyer as bad as their client and then the, the arguing continues to, yeah, to, w- to bubble up which i think is sad because at the end of the day it hurts everybody. If if you're a lawyer and you're waging personal battles, you end up getting hurt as much, if not more, than the person you're trying to go against. Our entire community gets hurt because people are less happy. And I think that there's there's a bright side to this. And if I look back on my personal experience, many of my closest friends who I met in my adult life were actually on the other side of cases from me. And I, I, you know, I'm guilty, of course, of sometimes going too far with opposing counsel or getting personal, feeling personally insulted and and losing that, you know, I'll call it a third wall between myself and my client and just what I was doing. But on the other hand, many of my very close friends now were on the other side of cases and we'd battle and we'd battle in court, we'd battle outside of court. But we'd also go out and have lunch, you know, after hearing, hey, you want to have lunch? Yeah. And that's how a lot of my good friends, uh, a lot of my friendships were formed. So more of that needs to happen. And there has to be more of a high level understanding that what you're doing is is a job. You have to be professional. And that if the professionalism breaks down, everybody suffers. It also brings up one other point is that Florida has often been criticized because it doesn't have reciprocity with other states. And any lawyer who's watching this will understand that reciprocity means that if you allow a lawyer to practice in, let's say, Virginia, that's a Florida lawyer, that Virginia lawyer should also be allowed to practice in Florida. Yeah, your license is recognized by another state. Florida does not do that. Primarily, the reason why Florida has not done that is it was historically a retirement state. Sure. And so they didn't want lawyers just coming down from like New York or Chicago and practicing in their later years and taking away business from local lawyers. That's a, it's a good reason, the old reason why. But thinking about it now today, I think there's a strong argument against reciprocity because you want to try to keep the community because the community is what will stop or at least halt a bit this overly adversarial system. Because what you just said is very important. You're talking about practicing law with people within your own community and talking with people who you know, you may see at school, you may see at functions. The moment that you allow a lot of people from outside the community to come in and practice within the community, you destroy yeah. that camaraderie. Three, and that, things break down further. And, and the camaraderie is good for everybody because, of course, the lawyers have a job to do and they're, gonna, they're going to be adversaries for their client first and foremost. But if you have camaraderie within your community, the, the, the petty nonsense that goes on can sometimes go away. But if you bring a lawyer in from out of town, 
they don't give a shit no, they at don't. all about what, what's going to happen with the one in the because community because the, they don't have to see right, them ever. All of the self-policing mechanisms break down. And, and these, these self-policing mechanisms, they're kind of old school. And maybe that's why they're not working as well anymore because just the world has changed. But reputation, you know, I'm sure you learned the same thing as I did growing up in law firms, being mentored by people. Mo- every single one of the lawyers who mentored me always emphasize reputation. They'd always tell me, your reputation's all you have. And if you go off and start doing stupid things, it's gonna ruin your reputation and no one's ever gonna take you seriously anymore and you're not gonna be able to do a good job. I'm not mm-hmm. so sure that's as effective anymore or as, as, as important, unfortunately. I'll never forget, I'll, we'll close with this. I'll never forget, when I left my first job, I was a defense lawyer. My boss wrote a little thing on a piece of paper for me because he knew I was going to be a plaintiff's lawyer. And the paper just said, it's not you, it's the case. And the reason why he wrote that to me was to remind me that none of the work that I'm doing should be about me. It should be about the case. And the moment that you make it about you right. is when all of this stuff starts to happen. So I always remember him writing that on a piece of paper for me. And although I probably forgot it in times of battle, I try to remind myself throughout the course of my career that it is not you, it is the case. Well, I think that that, that mentality applies outside of the law. Right. I think any any person working any kind of job can sometimes fall victim to identifying themselves with their jobs. There's they they lose any sort of separation between who they are as a person and who they are as as a professional. And that can be very dangerous even, you know, outside of the law of course. It's not just limited to lawyers, but I think lawyers working in an adversarial system that's in many to- in many cases overwhelmed all these things coalesce and, and produce a pretty, sometimes very negative environment. And, and I hope that some people come up with some innovative ways to, to start to self-regulate again and have a healthy community of practicing lawyers, because it's important. So remember, it's not you, it's the case. Yeah. And this is Trials and Tribulations with Larry and Justin. We hope you'll join us on the next episode. Thank you very much. That's a better title than Lawyers Behaving Badly. That'll be the title. All right, done. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. This episode was sponsored by Levelesque.